Hello, hello, and welcome again. Alt Sadu, Old Saxon Heathens Who Keep the Old Ways. Today's video is going to be on the Stalinga Uprising, the failed attempt by the heathen Saxons to overthrow their forced conversion to Christianity. Now, the background of the Stalinga Rebellion is in the Saxon Wars. The Saxon Wars happened in 772 AD and ended in 804. They were a 33-year war where the Franks invaded Saxony, they destroyed the Saxon Ermensul, they conquered them, and they forcefully brought them into Christianity. Now this is a Christian writing. The writers who left us history were the winners. So no ifs, ands, or buts, the Christians preserve this, and this is the Christian side of the story, and that is genocide of the heathen at their hands. So, the Royal Frankish Annals, which were written during Charlemagne's lifetime, which were written during the Saxon Wars themselves, states, while the king, Charlemagne, spent the winter at the Villa of Quirzri, he decided to attack the treacherous and treaty-breaking tribe of the Saxons and to persist in this war until they were either defeated and forced to accept the Christian religion or to be entirely exterminated. So again, this is an 8th century writing and it is discussing genocide or forced conversion as the only two options. Now the Franks invaded Saxony in 772 AD. This was the event that started the Saxon Wars. And the entry in the Royal Frankish Annals states the following, the most gracious Lord King Charles then held an assembly at Worms, and from Worms he marched into Saxony. He captured the hill fort at Erisburg and proceeded as far as the Ermensul, destroyed this idol and carried away the gold and silver he found. A great drought occurred, so there was no water in the place where the Ermensul stood. The glorious king wished to remain there two or three days in order to destroy the temple completely, but they had no water. So from this we learn that there was a hill fort at Erisburg, and there was a giant idol, and it was carried away along with the gold and silver that was found there, and there was a temple there. And the question is, is the Yermansul a god pole inside the temple, or is it a tree on the outside of the temple? I have a video on that. But let's continue the next source. The Annals Petaviani state, which was written around 775 AD, the Charlemagne, he, he conquered the Erisberg and found the place that is called Ermensul and set those places on fire. So I do believe that the Ermensul was right next to Erisberg itself. And really, this is the prelude to the Stellinga Rebellion, which happened in 841 through 842 AD. So this is 37 and 38 years after the Saxons were forced into Christianity. So this is the background of the Stellinga Rebellion. And the Royal Frankish Annals also state um, that in the year 785, that there was a massacre at Verden. So what was going on? Let's give some backup before I read this Royal Frankish Annals passage. So basically how the Saxon Wars worked is, yes, it was a 33-year war. But what happened is Charlemagne bribed the Saxon nobles to change sides. He made them dukes over their own land. So basically he came, offered them riches and said, instead of me overthrowing you militarily, you're going to convert to Christianity. You're now going to have more political power than you ever had. And I'll come back to that. And I'm going to pay you to turn on your own people. So here is an example of this in the Saxon Wars. The passage states from the Royal Frankish Annals, written about the year 785 AD. When the king heard of this disaster, he decided not to delay, but he made haste to gather an army and march into Saxony. There he called to his presence the chiefs of the Saxons, or the nobles, and inquired who had induced the people to rebel. 
They all declared that Wittekin was the author of the treason, but said that they could not produce him because after the deed was done, he had fled to Nordmania, which is Denmark. But the others who had carried out his will and committed the crime, they delivered up to the king to the number of 4,500. And by the king's command, all were beheaded in one day in the river Aller, in a place that is called Verden. So we really have just a couple sources on the massacre of Verden. And what we know about it is that the Saxons won a couple battles. And one of them they won was with Wittekin, the most famous Saxon heathen. He led the lower two castes, which was 98% of Saxon society. He led them to overtake a Frankish army at the Suntel Mountains. They used guerrilla tactics and attacked them by surprise at night, which lured out another part of their force because they, they would split up into two parts. These Frankish forces were going through Saxony to attack the pagan Sorbs and to try to convert them as well. And uh, so after using guerrilla tactics to attack one side, the other side came out and uh, they followed Saxons up the Suntel Geberga and the Saxon archers neutralized the cavalry and they used the forest to their advantage and they wiped out pretty much the entire army. They killed over 20 Frankish nobles. So basically Charlemagne got mad after 10 years of the Saxon Wars at this point, he was fed up. He was tired of fighting the Saxons. He had bribed all the nobles successfully, but Wittekind, who was the only noble that didn't accept the bribes. And the lower classes loved Wittekind. And, you know, they never, even if they were losing their heads, which 4,500 of them did, uh, they didn't give up where he was. Um, and even if they got Nordmania or Denmark out of them, they weren't going to catch Wittekin there. So we do have this history where the Franks, they come in, they attack Saxony, they destroy the Ermansul, they take away all the gold and silver. They build the castle in place of the former hill fort and religious shrine, and they even built a church to desecrate the site. They then decide that they're going to commit genocide or do forced conversion. Those were the only two options. And brutal warfare. And they also had the Lex Saxonum, which I didn't uh, include in one of my slides here. But, you know, they issued Saxon capitularies in the Lex Saxonum, which is a law code that forbid heathenry on the pain of death. If you didn't observe the Good Friday fast after your forced baptism, you would be put to death publicly in the village watching. Um, you know, if you uh, desecrated a church, you'd be put to death. Um, you know, there were horrible laws that enforced um, Christianity. There was no um, doing heathenry in the holy places in the sacred groves. Uh, doing... Uh, Heathenry there was forbidden by the Lex Saxonum themselves. Following heathen holy days was forbidden by the Lex Saxonum. None of the heathenry was going to be brought into the church. None at all. It was very harsh. And this is the background for the rebellion. And what's more important probably than this history is to understand Saxon society. Why did the Stalinga exist? Because to be blunt, there are not many rebellions that... Um, serfs rose up against nobles in history because typically a bunch of serfs with pitchforks would not stand to nobles on horseback. They, they did not have the means to stand up to them. And we had four sources that discussed the stacks and Stalinga. So why um, was there so much anger and why did this revolt happen? Well, here's why. We have three sources that I'm going to quote now. The Levuini and Tukwa IV, which is the life of St. Levuin, written in the 9th century. And this book says, in olden times, the Saxons had no king, but appointed rulers over each gau, or village. And their sidhu, or their custom, was to hold a general meeting once a year, a general thing once a year, in the center of Saxony near the river Weser, at a place called Marklo. There the leaders used to gather together and they were joined by 12 
noblemen from each gal, with also 12 freedmen and 12 serfs from each gal. So there's around 100 Saxon gal, give or take a little, and you have equality amongst the Saxons. There's three social classes in their society, and the nobles have 12, the freedmen have 12, and the serfs have 12. And they together confirmed their laws. They gave judgment on outstanding cases and by common consent drew up plans for the coming year in which they would act in either peace or, or war. So what I'm saying is that, you know, if you read a German history book today, they start with the Third Reich and work their ba way backwards, basically saying the German people always wanted peace and democracy, which, you know, is basically how German history books bullshit you. Because reality the Germanic tribes that became the Saxons, they were led by someone named Arminius in 9 AD who wiped out Rome. These people had no kings and they believed in a representative republic and that all people had equal say, whether they were noble freemen or serfs. And that's how their society was set up. So you have two reasons for the Stalinga uprising. You have one, the religious, they did not like being forced into the church. And the Lex Saxonum also forced uh, for two slaves out of every 120 people. So imagine if one, you know, you were one out of the, or two out of the 120 that were chosen to be given as slaves to the church as part of forced conversion. I mean, that was part of their tithe. Um, so they're being forced to go to church. They're being forced to learn the Frankish religion. They're being forced to give up their holy days. They're being forced to give up their culture. They're having to give tithes. So they're having to pay for their forced conversion. And tithes were enforced by pain of death. And on top of it, now Charlemagne has bribed the nobles who betrayed them. And these betrayers, uh, like the Benedict Arnold, so to speak, of the Saxons are now being their lords. Um, and they're losing their rights and their equality and their voice in Saxon affairs and Saxon government. So that's very important to understand why the Stalinga happened. Now, I said three quotes, so let's go over the other two. The English monk Beda, which people call him Bede today, um, in his Ecclesiastical History of the English People, he said, for these old Saxons, as in the Saxons in Saxony. They have no king but several lords who are set over their nation, and whenever war is imminent, these cash lots impartially, and the one on whom the lot falls is obeyed by all for the duration of the war. But as soon as the war ends, the, lord, the lords revert to equality of status. So while, if we compare it to Nithart's quote, while the Saxons had three classes, um, only a noble would lead them in battle and the nobles would cast lots. And if the one who the gods decided through the rune casts, um, they would lead the nation for that summer. But when the war period, the war season was over, whether they were defending themselves or whether they were uh, going on the offensive, so to speak, when the war was over, they would revert to equality of status because the Saxons didn't like kings. You also had Nithard, who's a Saxon himself. He is a grandson of Charlemagne, but through his grandmother, he has Saxon blood. And he wrote in the ninth century, he's a Frankish count and historian, he wrote in his histories, he said, Charlemagne, deservedly called emperor by all nations, converted the Saxons to the true religion of God from the vain cult of idols through much diverse toil, it is, as it is known to all the nations in Europe. The Saxons from the beginning were distinguished as, as nobles and often with many indications as most zealous for war. These people are entirely divided into three orders or caste. There are those who are called in their language Anilingi, Freelingi, and Lassi, and in the Latin tongues that is nobles, free, and servile. So that is exactly how we have three sources that really state, you know, they, the Saxons had an all thing and they had three classes and they all had equal vote. And Charlemagne took away the religion and took away their way of life and their government. So why did the Stalinga happen? Well, it would be nice to say simply, well, you know, they hated Christianity, so they rose up against it. Ha ha ha. Um, it was more than that, because as I said, you know, revolts against nobles who had armor and horses and things that the peasants don't have 
Um, they didn't happen often in history because they would get crushed. Um, so to understand the Stalinga, you have to know that, but you also have to know that um, there was a, a historical event going on that was causing division in the Frankish Empire itself. The Franks had in their society a law where if a king has four sons and they survive him at his death, his kingdom is divided into four parts and the sons rule each their one fourth of the estate. So the background is really when Charlemagne dies, he has one son that survives him. So Louis the Pious, for the 30 some years after Charlemagne's death, he is running Charlemagne's empire, his Reich. But when Louis the pious died, he had three sons, and they all wanted all the power. They didn't want to share the power. And what's interesting is, you know, Louis had two legitimate children. Well, actually, all of them that survived him were legitimate, but through, you know, two brothers were much older than the youngest one. So Louis the German had a different mom, and he was just a baby um, when Louis the pious took over. The other two brothers, Lothair and Charles the Bald, they were older. And at first, uh, Louis the Pious said that Lothair was going to inherit his empire. But then, you know, he had a third son and then he decided, you know, um, two years before his death, he was going to split it equally amongst the three. And Lothair, the oldest, was pissed about that, despite the fact that that was the Frankish custom. We now are going to have a, a three-way civil war going on uh, between the, you know, it was more two-way, but trust me, the three children all fought for themselves. But it was really Lothair trying to force the other two to be in line to him, and the other two won. But during this Frankish civil war, uh, because the nobles were bribed, the Saxon nobles were bribed, and they were really just hanging around the Franks for their money, um, suddenly, when there's a divided Frankish kingdom, you have nobles choosing sides. And when the nobles in Saxony are choosing sides, you now have a divided Saxon nobility as well, which gives the perfect environment for an uprising to do two things. To get rid of these fucking bastards who um, turned on their own people and accepted Frankish bribes to enforce Christianity on the masses, when the nobles were supposed to take care of the lower two classes, which were the, you know, the bulk of Saxon society. So you have this resentment um, going on between the nobles and the lower castes. And not only did they side with Christianity and handed over their 4,500 children to be beheaded, which, you know, doesn't go away, kind of like 9-11, 20 years later in America, we still remember it, we're still annoyed about it. You know, when tragedy happens, you don't forget the tremendous evil done to you. So they didn't just look at Charlemagne. Um, they looked at the nobles who accepted Charlemagne's bribes, who handed the 4,500 over to Charlemagne to be had as part of the problem. So once the nobility were divided, the Saxon heathens, um, you know, yeah, they were forced into Christianity, but they were keeping heathenry in their homes and going to church probably pissed off and begrudgingly giving 10% of all they owned to the church by force of arms. But as soon as the Frankish and the Saxon nobles are divided and a civil war is going on, the Saxons use this to rebel. So if you understand history really well, the, the Battle of Fontenoy occurred and uh, the two younger sons defeated Lothair, and basically that led to the creation of modern Italy, modern Germany, and modern France. And back then, you know, they, they were so used to land changing hands over the decades in Europe, no one would have thought that these boundaries that they drew up would still be lasting 1,200 years later through today. But basically after the war, Lothair got Italy and Switzerland Louis the German, the youngest, got what became Germany over the centuries, and uh, Charles the Bald's descendants uh, kept Aachen and Paris, and the you know the lands that became eventually France. And of course, you know, it, I'm simplifying this, oversimplifying it, but basically that's kind of how Charlemagne's empire was carved up. But nonetheless, because the Battle of Fontenoy happened, where the 
Saxon nobles were leaving their homes and they were going into um, a Frankish civil war with their noble armies. They left the lower cl classes behind at home and they rebelled in their absence. So what does the word Stalinga mean? Uh, Stalinga is a word that means heathen companions. Now I put heathen in parentheses because, you know, we know that um, even the word to be allied, um, the Inga part, the N part is to be allied in Old Saxon. So this is an allied, a unified um, approach where the lower caste are completely united together as companions to uh, fight the aggression of the Christian bribed Saxon nobles and the Frankish forced Christianity. So, and again, I said that it happened during the years 841 through 842, and the goal of the Stalinga was to regain the ancient Saxon society, culture, and heathenry before forced Christianization. So, as I said before, they had rights of representation they had an equal vote in government, and they wanted that voice back, as well as their heathenry back. Because Charlemagne had abolished their heathen republic and their heathen thing at Marclos once a year, and he basically put those nobles in charge. So the whole point of the Stalinga was to live in accordance with the ancient Saxon tribal heathen customs. Now, I said before, the Frankish Civil War happened. It happened from 840 to 843, but it was pretty much done after the Battle of Fontenoy. You know, um, Lothair begrudgingly took his lands. He still fought his brothers here and there, but it was very minor because, you know, when you have pitched battles like the Battle of Fontenoy, everything's on the line and lots of people die with uh, axes, spears, uh, you know, lances, uh, you know, and there were huge casualties, and um, basically they they put it all on the line in a pitch battle, and the younger brothers won. So um, this was the background of the Stalinga uprising. Now there are four sources for this Stalinga rebellion, which is really amazing because there's only three sources that describe Charlemagne being crowned emperor or Kaiser by the Pope. Um, in the year 800, but yet we have four sources for the Stalinga Rebellion, which tells you how much of an impact this had in the society of Europe at the time. Uh, you know, and here are the four sources. There are the Annales Zentenses, and I'm probably butchering the Latins, the Annals Bertiani, written by Prudentius of Troyes, the Annals Fuldensis, written by Rudolf of Fulda, and the History of Nithard. Now, here's the Annals Zentensis. It states, throughout all Saxony, the power of the slaves rose up violently against their lords. They usurped for themselves the name Stalinga, and the nobles of the land were violently persecuted and humiliated by the slaves. And Nithard also, I mean, he describes this more. Remember, Nithard has... Charlemagne as uh, uh, a grandfather, but he also does have some Saxon blood in him. And he wrote the most uh, detailed account of the Stalinga. So I'm just gonna read it. This is from Nithard's histories written in the ninth century. And Nithard lived through this and he wrote about it. So um, Emperor Charles is one of the three children, Charles the Bald. So Emperor Charles, Oh, and here, sorry, this is Charlemagne, their grandfather. So Emperor Charles, um, deservedly called Magna or Charlemagne, uh, Charlemagne the Great, Charles the Great, by all peoples. He converted the Saxons by much effort, as is known everywhere throughout Europe. He won them over from the adoration of idols to the true Christian religion of God. From the beginning, the Saxons have proved themselves by many examples to be both noble and extremely warlike. This whole tribe is divided into three classes. There are among those who are called Analingi in their language, and those who are called Freelingi, and then there are those who are Lassi, or nobles. Or excuse me, Lassi, or, or serfs. And these in the Latin language means nobles, freemen, and serfs. In the conflict between Lothair and his brothers, the nobility among the Saxons was divided into two factions, one following Lothair and the other Louis. Since this was how matters stood, and Lothair saw that after his brother's victory at the Battle of Fontenoy, the people who had been with him wished to defect, 
he was compelled by various needs to turn to help anywhere he could get it. He distributed public property for private use. He gave freedom to some and promised it to others after his victory. He also sent into Saxony to the immense number of Freelingi and Lassi, promising them if they should side with them, that he would let them have the same law in the future, which their ancestors had observed when they were still worshiping idols. Since they desired this law above all, they adopted a new name, Stalinga, rallied to a large host, almost drove their lords from the kingdom, and each lived as their ancestors had done according to the law of his choice. So I'm actually going to stop right there. So basically, um, after the Battle of Fontenoy, Lothair was not satisfied that he lost. He, would, he did not want just to have one third of the empire. He wanted to get it back. So he kept threatening for more war and more war. And he went to the Saxons in Saxony, the peasants, knowing that, you know, they weren't always happy about being dragged into the Frankish wars. They were always being recruited to fight with the Franks to convert the other non Christian neighbors of the Saxons and to be forced into Christianity as well. And they hated that because they loved their own freedom. So suddenly you have, you know, one of the Frankish, one of the three Frankish descendants of Charlemagne approaches them and says, hey, if you side with me, you give me your armies. And if I can overthrow my two brothers, I'm going to let you be heathens again. You're still going to be a part of my empire, but you're going to be completely free. You're, you can be heathen. You can burn down all the churches you want. You can have your Marclo assembly back. Um, you know, I'm going to not let the nobles who sided with me now continue to persecute you. And Nithard sensed that they desired this above all else. They wanted their freedom. They wanted their voice in government back. And they wanted their heathenry back that they sided. Um, and they went along with Lothair. So while the Saxon nobles were gone fighting, you know, against uh, Lothair's brothers, they rose up with the few nobles left in Saxony and they overthrew them. And now continuing the quote, um, it says that Lothair also called in the Norsemen to help the, him. And he put some Christians under their lordship and permitted them to plunder others. And Lewis is in one of the other brothers. Lewis feared that the Norsemen, heathens, and pagan Slavs might unite with the Saxons, who call themselves Stalinga because they are neighbors. And they might invade the kingdom and revenge themselves to root out the Christian religion in the area. So this is why four sources wrote about it, because, you know, for those who didn't watch the Last Kingdom TV show, they really show that the Danes don't have much unity, which is kind of true historically, but it's not true historically. I mean, in order to conquer most of England and install Dane law, they had to have some strong leadership. You don't just march a great heathen army by sea, land in England, if you're a divided force. Um, they had more unity than the TV show showed historically. But at the same point in time, when you study Saxon history and you have during the Saxon War, Saxon heathens like Wittekin taking refuge in Denmark, the Danes aren't willing to fight the Franks, which was kind of stupid. But they're willing to allow Saxon fugitives to hide in their territory under their protection. And the reason why I said it was kind of stupid for the Danes not to fight with the Saxons is because if all the heathens stood together, like all the Christians were standing together. I mean, say what you want about Christianity, but you, they unite strong under Christ. There was no Protestant church at that time. And when Christians had a battle cry to kill the heathens, that really united the Christians. And unfortunately, it did not always say, hey, we're fighting for our heathenry. It didn't always get the heathens united as much because the Danes and the Swedes and the Geats and the Norwegians you know, they, they were all still their own kind of pocket groups. But if they all stood together and they all allied together, um, they would have been able to pro probably keep their heathenry for longer, maybe permanently. I mean, I kind of doubt that because Christian Europe, it was far more populous and they had more armies to throw at them. But it would have made a big difference. And that's how Charlemagne defeated the Saxons, by bribing some of the nobles, most of the nobles, he got the Saxons to turn on themselves. And that was a big key there. Um, so, 
you know, the lower two Saxon cast, they remembered this and they fought against it and they were tired. But unfortunately, after Lothar was defeated again, Louis the German comes back as we get to, you know, the rest of Nithard's quotes. He says, you know, I, I'm skipping several paragraphs, but, you know, after, you know, the sons of grandsons of Charlemagne, they are done fighting each other. They then fight some wars together to keep their three empires safe. Louis then returns back um, and he distinguishes himself by putting down, not without rightful bloodshed, the rebels who in Saxony, as I said before, called themselves Salinga. And even one of the sources on it, um, you know, I, gosh, I wish I put that in this video, but, you know, they, they hung 118 Saxons, I think it was, they beheaded some, they chopped arms off of some, they chopped legs off of some. They made a public uh, spectacle uh, the Frankish and Saxon nobles of the lower castes, because, you know, once the, the Franks and the, the Saxon nobles were done fighting themselves, unfortunately, even shield walls without horseback did not stand up to cavalry charges. They were pretty much run over. And the Stalinga, it lasted for a couple of years because the Franks and the Saxons were fighting themselves, the Saxon nobility. And the peasants said, screw this, I've had enough. Um, and again, you know, the real scarce, uh, scaring point to the Christian kingdoms was that, um, you know, if all the heathens unite, this would be a great tragedy to the church. So this was my discussion of the Saxon Stalinga, its history. Come visit us at aldsadu.com. Also visit us on the Facebook group Saxon Heathenry, and please hit like and subscribe. Thank you.